Today we're in chapters 70, 71, and 72, or Psalms 70, 71, and 72, as we continue our, our look at the Psalms. And what we'll do is we'll pick up first at Psalm 70. Psalm 70 only has five verses, and so we'll read verses 1 through 5 here in Psalm 70. I'll give you a study in it. We'll pick up at Psalm 71 and then move to 72 and conclude with Psalm 72. So let's begin reading here in Psalm 70 at verse 1. I'll read to verse 5, and we'll get into our, our study. Psalm 70, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 5. Psalm 70 is written by David. David writes, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, Aha, aha. Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. And let those who love your salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. But I am poor and needy. Make haste to me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. Now, this is called a psalm of remembrance. And what's interesting is that uh, the psalm basically is a repetition of something we've already looked at in Psalm 40. As a matter of fact, these five verses are basically a repeat of Psalm 40, verses 13 through 17. The question could be asked, obviously, why is this repeated? And the answer is simple. It's because our memories are simply not that good. Obviously, we need to be constantly reminded uh, by the Lord. There are various things in Scripture that we read more than once. And the reason we have to be reminded is because we have a tendency of forgetting things rather quickly. The Apostle Peter, when he was writing in the New Testament, said it this way in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. He said, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you'll never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you. And so there are various times in Scripture that you'll see the Lord Jesus Christ, for example, give the same basic story or the same message, if you will, though it may be in different circumstances, different times, you'll see that there are so many similarities to it. For example, and without going in, into any detail, we have what is called the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. When you see the Sermon on the Mount and you compare it with the Sermon on the Plain, you'll see that Jesus is basically giving the same message, and yet He's doing it two different times in two different locations. And there are times that the Lord will repeat something. As a matter of fact, as we're going through Mark, we're noting now that Jesus teaches more than once that He's going to be uh, betrayed and that He's going to be delivered into the hands of evil men. He's going to be tried. He's ultimately going to die. He's going to be buried. He's going to be resurrected. You see Him, repeat him repeating that more than one time because there are some things He needs to say more than once. And the reason being, obviously, that we can forget. And so that's what this is. It's a song of remembrance. He's actually asking the Lord to remember him, but it also reminds us that we ought to be reminded of the things of the Lord. So in verse 1, he says, Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. So he's aware of his enemies, and his enemies are attempting to destroy him. And the anxiety that he senses over this is so great, he begins to cry out for divine help. It is possible, of course, to be a person of faith and still to have anxiety. And what do you do with your anxiety is really the question. You can't have it. You can't have a moment of fear. You can't have a moment of, 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 of just your, your, your faith not really remaining strong. And all the question is, what do you do? Well, in Psalm 56, verse 3, remember with me that the psalmist said, whenever I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. And that's what the Lord calls us to do, to trust in Him. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, some trust in chariots, some in horses, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. So when we have those options, when we're going through things that are difficult, what the Lord would have us to do is to remember to put our trust in Him. And that's what happens here in Psalm 70. He says, make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Verse 2, let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame who say, aha, Aha, uh -huh. may my enemies be dealt with justly, he's saying. May they 
realize the things that they're doing are so wrong. And God, the way that's going to happen is when you come to my aid speedily because I need your help and I need it right now. And when you arrive on time and deliver me, it's going to prove to my enemies that you are on my side. As I think about this, I, I realize that there are some circumstances that you and I may find ourselves in that we begin to cry out almost immediately because we recognize the seriousness of that situation, or the danger of the moment. Some things may creep up on us, and we may not realize the gravity of them. We may not realize that we're moving into an area that is dangerous and all. But sometimes it's just very obvious, and that's why we'll cry out to the Lord, you need to, you need to deliver me quickly. You need to make haste. I was thinking about this today, and I was asking the Lord for a way to illustrate this, this kind of impulse to ask for help when you know that you're in trouble. And I couldn't help but remember something from, from my childhood when I was around six years old. My brother Frank and I were playing in the garage, and, and we used to go and play in the garage all the time during the summer especially. We'd go into the garage, and we would close the, the garage door, so it became kind of like our fort. It was a private place for my brother and me to play in, and often our friends would come, and we'd just play in the garage, and we'd do various things that boys did, you know. We would just play in the garage. My father was a truck driver, and, and my father had brought home some containers, some very small containers that were cylinders, and they had a, a cap that you could place on them. And my dad had brought those home because he would use them to, uh, to throw trash in and all of that, and he needed it because he was doing some work and all. So he brought two of those cylinders home, and he stored them in the garage. My brother Frank and I, my brother must have been around eight years old at the time, I was around six or so, decided that those cylinders made perfect rocket ships. And so what we did is we got a hammer and a nail, and we, we put a hole in the center of the lid because we knew that we needed some oxygen, and so we used this little teeny nail and put a little teeny hole inside of that. Then we both climbed inside, each one in a separate cylinder, and we pulled the caps on so that we were in the dark because we were in space and we were traveling in our rocket ships. We had closed the garage door, and we were sitting there next to one another in the rocket ship when we began to suffocate because we didn't realize, we're a little voice, we didn't realize that that little hole that we put in there was not sufficient to help us to breathe. And I can still remember as a little boy beginning to get faint, and I can still remember yelling to my brother who was right next to me, I can't breathe. And my brother began to yell, I can't breathe either. And, and the thought of the tragedy, you can imagine a young mother walking into that garage to find her children in those cylinders, the thought is beyond me even now. All I know is that I began to pass out because I couldn't breathe, and my brother said, kick the lid off, kick the lid off. I remember trying to kick it off, but I was a little guy, and the suction had created such a draw, there was no way I was strong enough to do that. And I basically, I just knew it was, you know, this is dangerous, but I didn't know the gravity of it. But my brother kept on kicking and kicking until he finally kicked the lid off of his, and I remember how he peeled the lid off of mine and, and released me and all of that. That desire to get out of that situation, make haste, help me now. Some of us understand that. I am in a situation right now that, Lord, unless you come and deliver me, I'm going down. That's what David is speaking about right here. That's what he's crying out, and that's what he's saying. He's saying, God, I am in a circumstance, in a situation that requires your immediate aid, and I'm crying out. And as I cry out, I want you to know that I'm asking you to deal with those who are, who are seeking my life. That's what he says in verse 2 again when he says, let them be ashamed and confounded who seek my life. Let them be turned back and confused who desire my hurt. Let them be turned back because of their shame. Those who are mocking me and laughing at me is the way he's putting it. You see, I want to glorify you, Lord, and I want you to deal with the enemies that have basically encamped about me because the enemies who have chosen to, to mock me and hate me are also your enemies, and that's why I'm asking that you would deal with them. In verse 4, he goes on to say, Let all those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation say continually, Let God be magnified. You see, when you move and deliver me, all who love you will praise you because of the way that you have delivered me. But again, verse 5, I am poor and I'm needy. Make haste to help me, O God. You are my help and my deliverer. O Lord, do not delay. I am totally dependent on you. 
I need you to move on my behalf. So please, Lord, do not wait a second longer. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 13, verse 6, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And so David is once again just reminding us that the Lord is our present help in our time of need and that what we need to do is call out to him and in doing so, God will be glorified when he delivers us. We need to remember that next time we're in having a real problem. Now, Psalm 71 is a very powerful and a beautiful psalm. Psalm 71 is a song written by an unknown believer. There are those who believe that this may have been David, but it's not certain because it's unnamed. What is certain as we read through this is that the psalmist has a long journey with the Lord. This is an older man who has spent a lifetime worshiping God, and he writes this. And as we look at this, it's at the end of his life, and he's pointing out that, that he has constantly trusted in God over a long life. He's come to fully trust in the one thing that, that, about God that is worthy of, of us remembering today, and that is that God is faithful and He's trustworthy. And because this is true, He's encouraging everybody to trust in the Lord. In verse 1, He says, In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong habitation to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O, o my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. So notice how he speaks here. I want you to see this as we develop this. Notice how he says, never, uh, never let me be put to shame. He says, deliver me, cause me to escape. He says, God, you need to save me. He's saying, be my refuge, be my rock, be my fortress. So obviously, he's, he's crying out to God for help, and he's crying out for God to help him against those who intend harm to him. That's what he says in verse 4 when he says, deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. So he said, Lord, I need you to be my refuge, rock, my fortress. I need you to deliver me. I need you to cause me to escape. I need you to save me. Now, on the basis of the fact that God is righteous, he can trust the Lord. Because God is the one who rules and acts righteously. That's the point he's making in verse 2 when he says, Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. I can trust in you because I know you are righteous, and that's the foundation of all my trust for you. One of the things we as believers need to understand today is you can trust in the Lord because he's righteous. You can trust in the Lord because he's just. You can trust in the Lord because he will be there for you, because he's good to his word. The Lord is capable of doing that and has promised that he will. And so he's crying out and he's saying, you are my rock and my fortress. Now, in verse 5, you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. By you I have been upheld from my birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. I want to develop this for a moment here and share a couple of thoughts with you about this. One of the things I see about this man is consistency over a lifetime. And a second thing I see about this man is that he didn't compromise. I was sharing with somebody and just talking to somebody just recently about, about uh, and I mentioned this, some of you perhaps have heard me make mention of this recently within the last week. But uh, I was talking to a young person. I was asking, what is it with, with some of the younger believers, speaking in terms of chronological age, not necessarily time of service to the Lord, how long they've been saved, but I'm talking about younger people, you know, who are in their teens or early 20s. And I was, I was asking the question, what is it with the young believers? I mean, what is it that is so exciting and enticing about the world that people are willing to come to church all the time, hear Bible studies quite often, and ignore it when the chips are down? When they've been taught all their life that they should flee fornication, yet they're still guilty of going to bed with one another at a, at a drop of a hat. When they've been taught that alcohol is going to destroy them, and undoubtedly over the years if they've been raised in the church and they have parents who love the Lord, undoubtedly they've seen relatives who have blown it with alcohol, and yet they seem so, you know, inclined to, to drink. You know, what is it that makes them think that it's so popular to, 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 to smoke and to do the things that, that make them appear to be just like the world. What is it? And I was speaking to a young person the other day, and as we were talking, one of the words that came up, and I found this was interesting, uh, was the word compromise. They're willing to compromise, this young person told me. They're willing to just do something to get along and not to be different than other people. 
Now, this young person was telling me that they spend a lot of time at home because their friends, even believing friends, think they're legalistic because they won't go out and party once in a while. That's the condition of many people in their lives. On the one hand, they say, I want to follow the Lord. On the other hand, they're willing to do basically anything if it's enjoyable for a season, you see. This is a man who was consistent from the time he was a child to his old age. This is a man who walked with the Lord, and he could speak concerning the goodness of God as he had traveled a long journey in the same direction. This is a man who was able to say that God has been faithful to me every step of the way, even when I've been in affliction. And many people who are afflicted or going through a hard time immediately turn away from God. He can say, no, I've seen God's hand on me even in the midst of trouble because God is good, and I understand that. I have experience with Him, you see. And that's what the Lord is calling for us, guys. God is calling us to have a relationship with Him that is consistent over a lifetime, to watch God bless our life. God can be your hope. God can be your confidence. God can be your strength. And in this case, He has been trusting the Lord from His youth, from the time He was born. Notice that in verse 5, you are my hope, O Lord God. You are my trust from my youth. It's, in this church, if you brought it to contemporary uh, imagery, it's like I was dedicated to you as an infant and I followed you all my life. Verse 6, by you I've been upheld from my birth. You are he who took me out of my mother's womb. My praise shall be continually of you. The Bible in Psalm 22, 9 and 10 says, You are he who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. What a tremendous testimony, a lifetime of trusting in God. You know, I remember hearing uh, testimony after testimony, and sometimes, especially when I was a young believer, you'd hear some of the radical testimonies, and people would get so enamored by them. You know, how this person used to do the drugs, and this person used to steal, and this person used to shoot people, and this person used to do so many terrible things and all. And, and then, then I remember hearing a young woman approach the pulpit, and she was giving her testimony after some, somebody had given this dramatic testimony how they had done so many bad things. And, and she walked up, and I'll never forget her testimony. It was a, a night that testimonies were being given at the church I was attending at that time. And, and she said, I really don't have much of a testimony. She says, I was born into a Christian home, raised by Christian parents, never did anything that was really that bad, and here I am today, you know. And she was in her late, late teens, maybe early 20s, and the pastor who was allowing them to share their testimony said, never, never think that the uh, saving grace of God is more magnificent than the keeping grace of God. He said, you need to understand that when God keeps somebody from sin, that's just as amazing as when somebody goes out there and, and gets saved, you know. And, and that's true. I think that a lot of people think that their lives are boring, you know, that following Jesus Christ is boring. And so the enemy has lied to so many, especially young people, but it's not just young people, has lied to so many people who who've said, you know, you've got better things to do uh, than to go to church. Come on, you can go once in a while because that's all right. It's no big deal. But don't get, don't get carried away with it. Well, this is a man who's saying, listen, I have been a follower of God from the time I separated the womb. I have been a follower of God since I was a baby nursing. In a sense, he's saying my life has been dedicated by my parents. I was raised in a home that taught me to fear the Lord. And he's speaking as an older man now, and he's speaking about the praise that he has to the Lord. And that's what he's saying in verse 6 when he says, my praise shall be continually of you. Verse 7, I've become a wonder to many, but you are my strong refuge. Let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all the day. You see, in my current situation, there are some who are getting confused. They're wondering why I'm in such trouble. But I've come to understand that my faith in the Lord doesn't exempt me from tough times. The Bible in Psalm 34, 19 says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. You see, God is a strong refuge in times such as these. So instead of complaining against the Lord, he cries out to him for comfort and help because his strength and his joy are in the Lord no matter what his circumstances may be. I believe that your depth is revealed through the trials you go through. I believe very strongly that the quality of your faith is demonstrated by the trials that you go through. And I don't know anybody in this room who'd go and buy a car that hasn't been stress-tested. I wouldn't want to drive a car that... that um, that the brakes have never been tested. Somebody just got an idea, these would be good brakes, let's put them on that car. I don't think I'd like to do that. 
I wouldn't drive a car or anything like that that hasn't been tested, gone through all kinds of ri rigid testing so that when I climb in it and I start that engine and I put it in drive and I drive away, uh, I'm going to arrive safely at wherever it is that I'm going. E everything has to be stress tested. Everything that we use, all the products that we have, have to be stress tested. Everything has to be designed properly and all, has to, be gone, uh, has to go through rigid testing and also that, that the quality of it will show. If there's something wrong with it, if there's a pressure point there that's going to break, then I need to know that. And, and in your faith with the Lord, what the Lord allows for you is for you to go through some trials. He allows you to have afflictions. He allows us to, to go through these things because it gives to us an opportunity to, to trust in Him and it gives us an opportunity to grow in our understanding of Him because it's in the going through of those things that we discover the depth of our own faith and the strength of the God who saves us. When you go through the hard times, it awakens you to the shallowness of your own convictions and reveals to you the, the lax uh, areas of our lives that, that God wants to work in. And, and, and when you discover these things, then you cast your cares on Him and you say, God, help me, and I need your strength. And, and what happens is, is you actually are tested and strengthened as a result of that. Now, now, a new believer may go through a testing and they get upset at God and they say, it's not even worth following God. Look, at, I thought when I went forward at that invitation and told God I was sorry, I thought for sure everything was going to be just so wonderful and so good from that day forward. But it seems it got worse the moment I said yes to Jesus Christ. I've discovered something like that. Did anybody in here discover that? that? That you can get saved and you're saying, oh, praise the Lord and everything is just wonderful and the birds are singing, the flowers are blooming and the sun is shining the first day. And after that, it's downhill. After that, it's one thing after another. The waves are overwhelming you sometimes, and you sense this, and, and you're wondering, hey, Lord, did I, you know, did I make a good choice in following you? Well, some of the people are watching what's taking place in this old saint, and they're saying, this is confusing to us. But he's not confused because he's been following the Lord a lifetime, and he knows that God has seasoned in, in his life, and God has always been good no matter what. He understands that. And because he does, he praises the Lord as he lives. But as he speaks to the Lord in verse 9, notice what it says. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. For my enemies speak against me. Those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together, saying God has forsaken him. Pursue and take him, for there is none to deliver him. I'm old, and my enemies think that I'm without help. They think that I'm weak. Well, I may be weak, he could say. I am physically weak. I'm, I'm not the, the strong man I once was. I may be physically weak, but I'm not defenseless because my God is on my side. My help comes from the Lord. So I'm asking God not to cast me off in my time of old age and not to forsake me when my strength fails. Isaiah, in chapter 40, verses 28 and 29, says something that I think is exceptionally beautiful. We read, have you not known, have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary? His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Isaiah 41, 13, I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, fear not, I will help you. And so he's trusting in the Lord. These people are saying God has forsaken him, but he's saying, no, Lord, don't cast me off in the time of old age. I'm trusting in you. In verse 12, O oh God, do not be far from me. Oh, my God, make haste to help me. Let them be confounded and consumed who are adversaries of my life. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor who seek my hurt. May their plans for evil result in them receiving what they deserve, is what he's saying here. It reminds me of what Jeremiah in chapter 20, verse 11 said. He said, The Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed. They will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. Continuing in verse 14, But I will hope continually and will praise you yet more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. I want to speak about that for just a moment. I want you to see this. In verses 14 through 16, he's saying, your righteousness causes me to have hope and a continual flow of praise for you. 
And he's saying, I am an evangelist, sharing of your goodness with all who will listen. Now, I want to share a couple of things. In verse 16, he says, I'll go in the strength of the Lord. I will make mention of your righteousness. This is the key to sharing your faith. We could offer you, and, in, 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 and occasionally perhaps in the past we have, and in the future we may again, we can offer you courses on how to give away your faith. And some people really do profit from that. They really do. And we've seen that in the past, where you can come and learn how to string scriptures together to share basic principles of salvation, because you want to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so you can put together the scriptures, it's an important thing to do, and you're able to learn to converse and to share and, and not to push your faith down somebody's throat, but to patiently share with them about the things of the Lord. And that's a wonderful thing to be able to do. But the key to witnessing is always going to be the strength of the Lord. The key to witnessing will always be the strength that comes from God. That's what he's saying in verse 16. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness of yours only. So the key to witnessing is power from on high. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus said, you shall receive power after that you have received the Holy Spirit. He said, and you will be witnesses of me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. If you want to have a powerful witness, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to see what he's saying here because it's really practical. I want to make mention of your righteousness is what he's saying here. I know that I've said this recently. Perhaps some of you might say, are you going to say that again? But allow me to remind you. Because as we already saw, you have a bad memory, so you probably forgot. So let me remind you. And I'm, I'm trying to find a way to say this so that it makes sense. In, uh, in, in our time, in the year 2004, we are part of a movement that we trace all the way back to Pentecost, but see it as a refreshing or a renewing and even a revival that broke out in the late 60s, early 70s that was called the Jesus Movement. The Jesus Movement. And the Jesus Movement is just that. It was a movement of the Holy Spirit where God began to elevate His Son, Jesus Christ. The 50s were some of the, the most wonderful years that this nation has ever enjoyed. But it has been said that more people went to hell in the 50s than any other time. And I'm not quite sure whether that's true or not, but I can say they were good days. They truly were. My kids have said, Dad, you were born in 1950. Were the 50s as good as everybody says? And I say, you know, they were wonderful days. They really were for me. In my situation, in the city I grew up, it was, it was just, they were very peaceful and wonderful years. Yes, I, I, and I've told them, yes, they, they were good. Those were good times. Then we entered into the 60s and things began to change. And during the 60s, we began to see things like riots. We began to see anger. We began to see conflicts that were uh, involving the United States. I can still remember as a, a boy in sixth grade uh, how that we were now moving into this small southeastern a uh, Asian nation called Vietnam and that, that our soldiers were beginning to go over there. And then over the years, I, I can still remember looking in the newspaper, and we actually had body counts, that there were counts of, of enemy killed and Americans lost. And, and before you know it, you'd see that week in, week out, month in, month out. And, and now young people are beginning to protest because this, this war is prolonged. It's not ending. And, and, and in the midst of all of that, people are beginning to cry out and say, there's something wrong here. Something's got to be done. There's got to be some changes. And before you know it, we had some Pied Pipers who showed up from England called the Beatles, and they began to bring music with them. That was different. And the music that they brought at first was just American rock and roll. Actually, British rockers used to bring black music in to the Americans. Americans would not listen to black music, so white people began to sing. Guys like Elvis Presley and Jerry Lee Lewis and others would begin to bring in this kind of music because it was a, it was a weird time in the United States and all racially, and so we began to hear these different kinds of musics coming in, and, and the Beatles actually started out by playing Little Richard and various other uh, songs that, that were done by artists like that, and then after a while, they began to experiment with, with Eastern religion, and before you know it, we're hearing these weird songs, I Am a Walrus, and things like that that made no sense, but we all bought into them. 
And he started singing about the fool on the hill, and we began to wonder what goo goo means anyway, you know. <laughs> and that gave rise to so many different expressions. And we had the folk rock, and we had the psychedelic rock, and we had such a variety, and we had Motown invasions in a variety of ways of thoughts and music and creativity. In the midst of this, you've got anger brewing, and you have men assassinated, and you have cities in riots. And you have anger that's just burning and people are beginning to wonder when are we going to get out of Vietnam and when are we going to, what's going to happen, give peace a chance. And everybody's crying out and everybody's saying, something's got to change, this isn't going to make it. We, are no, we don't have hope at all. The ecology, you know, we've got the red tide and we've got so many other things, you know, ecology, people, ecologists began to, to be listened to in our diets and you name it and everything began to in, invade. And, and then you got kids like myself who are, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, growing up listening to John Lennon, who was a prophet in my mind, influencing me like you wouldn't believe it, and, and guys like that. Philosophers like the Doors, you may not recognize them as philosophers, but indeed they were. They were philosophic in the things that they had to say. And when they were singing about breaking on through to the other side, that was actually a philosophy that they were trying to espouse that we were beginning to embrace and began to understand. And we thought our minds could be opened up by drugs, so we dropped acid and we did those things in order that we'd be in tune with the, with the other dimension that was out there. And it was all lost and it was all empty and, and relationships began to be developed. That, that uh, sexual revolution occurs and before you know it, uh, you know, chastity no longer is in vogue. And, and then people like me began to say, you know what, there's got to be more than what I'm experiencing because it sure is empty. I've tried it. I did the drugs, did the alcohol, did what it was told that I should do. I, I tried to become heavy and deep and philosophic and smoke the pot and do the whole nine yards and try and speak deep thoughts and think deep thoughts, but I didn't know anything. And nobody else did. Timothy Leary became our prophet, and he never really knew anything. The Moody Blues sang about him and told us, you know, Timothy Leary's dead. No, he's on the outside looking in, and we're going, oh, yeah, heavy, what's that mean? I don't know, but pass the joint over here, and we'll talk about it. <laughs> that was basically it. In the midst of all of that, the Times says that God is dead. God is dead. Church attendance is down. Nobody trusts religion anymore. And a year later, Jesus is on the cover of Time magazine, and the Jesus Revolution is beginning to be broadcast. Because God began to move in a powerful way, guys. God began to move in various places, but especially as we understand it, he began to move through a young man by the name of Chuck Smith, who at that time was a young man. The first time I sat under Pastor Chuck's teaching, he was 43 years old, and I was 20. And he was an old man to me. He's 43 years old. And he was bald. <laughs> and we liked the long hair. But he had something. And that Calvary Chapel that we went to had something. And what it had was Jesus. You see, guys, and I'm saying all of that just to give you a bit, little bit of a background so I can bring you to this. The Jesus movement birthed Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel did not birth the Jesus movement. The Jesus movement is about Jesus. So if you're called Calvary Chapel, or you're called Applegate Christian Fellowship, or you're called the First Baptist Church of Oxbow, Arkansas, it really doesn't matter if Jesus is there, because Jesus never stopped moving. We just stopped being aware that he was even alive. And when we began to embrace him, religion, as I understood it, no longer had any sway in my life. All I wanted was him. And so what we had is the Jesus movement, guys, and we had Jesus people, and we had Jesus music because it was Jesus Christ. And so I am pleased to say that I worship the Lord as a Calvary Chapel pastor. And I am grateful to God and always will be because of the influence that Pastor Chuck Smith and others have had in my life, Calvary guys. But I've always appreciated the fact that Jesus is the center of all attention. And see, that's the bottom line. I wanted to bring that up to tell you that we need to understand that we are still in the Jesus movement. One of the things that 
I discovered as a, uh, a new believer that I want to you to have, I want to communicate this to you, is that we new believers were evangelists. We were taught when we got saved, we were taught you need to read the Word of God. We were taught you need to pray. We were taught you need to fellowship with other believers. And we were taught you need to take this, this truth, this, this life, this, this joy, this peace, this goodness, this power, you need to take it outside of these four walls. And you need to tell your friends about it. You need to tell your family about it. And you need to live in such a way that they can see that God really is doing something in you. We were evangelists. We were trained to be that, not because they would stand up and do even as I'm doing right now and say, you need to... No, we, were, we, we got so turned on to Jesus Christ, He transformed us so radically, so radically, that we could not help but speak about Jesus and what He's done in our life. That's what transformed my father. That's what transformed my mother. That's what transformed my sisters, and that's what transformed my brother. That's what transformed my girlfriend, who, who, or the girl who came to my Bible study, who became my girlfriend, who became my wife. It was never anything but and never has been anything but, but Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit working in you enables you to go out and speak not about Calvary Chapel, but about Jesus Christ. That's what he's speaking about here in an Old Testament sense. When he had said in verse 6, my praise shall be continually of you. In verse 8, let my mouth be filled with your praise and with your glory all day. When he speaks about God being the one who, who fills him and strengthens him, in verse 16, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. That's what we need, guys. That's what we need. Now, I thank God that the Lord has filled this place and that people come to this church, of course. But it's for Jesus' sake, isn't it? It's, it's so that we might worship and know him and love his word and be equipped for works of service and not for any other reason. And so we ask the Lord, we ask him to fill us with his Holy Spirit and empower us that we might be able to do those works that are pleasing to him. And I wanted to encourage you in that because he says, I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of your righteousness, of yours only. Verse 17, O oh God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Also your righteousness, O oh God, is very high. You have done great things, O oh God, who is like you? You have shown me great and severe trouble, shall revive me again. Bring me up again from the depths of the earth. You shall increase my greatness and comfort me on every side. Also, with the lute I will praise you and your faithfulness, O my God. To you I will sing with the harp, O Holy One of Israel. My lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you. And my soul, which you have redeemed, my tongue also, shall talk of your righteousness all the day long, for they are confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. Now notice verse 17, you have taught me from my youth to this day I declare your wondrous works. And notice verse 18 at the end where he says, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation. I don't want to die until I have an opportunity to speak to the young people about how good you are. I want to be used by God, he's saying. I want to be used by you to take this wonderful message of how great you are to young people. Listen, young people don't need me, their pastor, to be their pal. Young people don't need generation, my generation and those who are just underneath me, 40s and all, they don't need us to be cool and, 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 and try and be like we're the young. We're not anymore. I can't act like a teenager. If I did, you'd, you'd, you'd put me in a straitjacket and, and, and say, grow up. I, I, I can't do that anymore. And you know what? I don't want to. I, I have come to realize and to believe with all of my heart that uh, many young people are not looking for pals as much as they're looking for mentors. They're looking for believers who can be examples of a successful Christian life in their old age. They're looking to us to grow up. They're looking to us to, so that we stop pursuing this fountain of youth and try and act so young constantly, try and be so cool constantly. You know, my generation doesn't want to grow up. We want to remain young all the rest of our lives. And it's just not going to happen that way. You can hate the gray and you can wash it away, but it comes back again. And that's the truth. 
That's just the reality of it. See, I discovered that my, my kids don't need a pal. They need a father. And, and their friends, their friends don't need somebody to hang around with and be cool with. They need someone they can look up to, somebody they can respect, somebody they can say, you've been walking with God a life, your lifetime, yes. I've been walking with the Lord now for 33, going on 34 years. I was 20 years old when I walked into Calvary Chapel for the first time. It was in the summer of 1970. And now for 33 years, going on 34 years, I have been following the Lord. My first 20 years were without him. The last 33, almost 34, have been with him. And I want to have a consistent life until the day I go home to be with the Lord where I can say I was young and now I'm old and I can say that God is good. And I can tell you from experience what God can do in a young person's life who yields themselves over to God. I can tell you what God will do. If you want to yield yourself over to the Lord at a young age and watch him as he weaves into you character and strength and integrity and gives you peace and joy and gives you opportunities to speak in his name, I can tell you, young people, there's nothing out there like being a great witness for Jesus Christ, and there's nothing more thrilling than watching some friend of yours who's been going the wrong way get right with God and change their life and become a testimony for him. Nothing as great as that. Nothing as wonderful as that. And this man here is an old man, but he says, Lord, don't forsake me. I want to declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who's to come. I want to be used by you until the day you take me home. One of the things we Christians need to always remember is though I might retire from a job, I never retire from my faith. I never retire from my faith. I never now take my, 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 my leave. I never take my leave of my faith. I am always growing in that until the day I go home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Chuck made it very clear one time. He was speaking, and he said that. He said, you know, the one thing about growing older as a Christian is you have more to offer every day that you live. And that's true. You have more of Jesus, more experience the longer that you live. And so he's saying, I just want to be used by you. Now, I've gone through deep things, he says in verses 19 through 21. But you've lifted me from them all. And as you continue to do so, it results in honor and the comfort that comes from you. Paul said it this way. He said in Romans 8, 38 and 39, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord you have revived me, you will revive me, strengthen me, increase my greatness, and comfort me on every side. And finally, he says in verses 22 through 24 that he's going to sing praise to God with musical instruments. When God delivers you, it produces a song of thankfulness and a willingness to speak of him. And again, that is the proper motivation for the sharing of your faith. And finally, we'll look at Psalm 72. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains will bring peace to the people and the little hills by righteousness. He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. They shall fear you as long as the sun and moon endure throughout all generations. He shall come down like rain upon the mown grass like showers that water the earth. In his days the righteous shall flourish and abundance of peace until the moon is no more. This is a psalm that is credited. Actually, I was reading in my commentaries as I was preparing this uh, to two different people. Uh, some will say that this is a psalm of King David, and others will say this is the king, psalm, uh, psalm of, of Solomon, and there's really no consensus on this, but it is a psalm of the king. And that's what he's speaking about. And he's praying that, that God will bless uh, the line of David. Now, it's not a kingly line alone that he's speaking about. He's speaking about the, uh, the, the line that leads to the ultimate king. It's the line that leads to Messiah. And this is a king who's to judge righteously and justly. This is the one who cares for the poor, and this is the one who cares for the orphans. And that's what he's speaking about in verse 2 when he says he'll judge your people with righteousness, your poor with justice. He's speaking of Messiah, and that's how he does how he does uh, rule and reign. In verse 4, he says he'll bring justice to the poor of the people. He'll save the children of the needy and break in pieces the oppressor. Verse 5, they shall fear you as long as the sun and moon 
endure. In other words, Jesus is going to reign in righteousness forever, and as he reigns, his blessings will pour out upon the righteous like showers on the earth. The Bible in Amos chapter 5, verse 24 says, Let justice run down like water, righteousness like a mighty stream. Jeremiah 23, 5, The days are coming, saith the Lord, that I'll raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper, execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. So Jesus is the one he's speaking of, the Messiah who rules and reigns in righteousness. In verse 8, He shall have dominion also from sea to sea. And from the river, that's the river Euphrates, to the ends of the earth. Those who dwell in the wilderness will bow before him, and his enemies lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish. The word Tarshish speaks of a land that is really not completely known, but most commentators believe it's speaking of, of Spain. The kings of Tarshish and the isles will bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba will offer gifts. Uh, Sheba is modern Yemen, and Seba is in upper Egypt. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. And so the bottom line is that he's going to have dominion. He's going to rule and reign throughout the whole earth. That's what Isaiah is speaking about in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, when he says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and will be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. When the Lord Jesus Christ begins to rule and reign, it's not just in a certain location where only certain people come. The Bible teaches that Messiah is going to rule and reign throughout the earth, and the people will stream into Jerusalem offering their gifts and worshiping him. He will deliver, verse 12, the needy when he cries, the poor also, and him who has no helper. He will spare the poor and needy and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence, and precious shall be their blood in his sight, and he shall live, and the gold of Sheba will be given to him. Prayer also will be made for him continually, and daily he shall be praised. There will be an abundance of grain in the earth on the top of the mountains. Its fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the city shall flourish like grass on the earth. His name shall endure forever. His name shall continue as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. All nations shall call him blessed. Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So verses 12 through 14, the king is worthy of his dominion because he's merciful, just, and compassionate. And God's love is revealed in his concern for those who are in need. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 6, if you take notes, it's found in verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, He lifted up His eyes towards His disciples and said this. He said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. One of the ways that you know that you have a relationship with the Lord is how you feel towards those in need. I was sharing with somebody recently, I don't remember who, but I was sharing that, and I've shared this with you before, that during the time of Jesus Christ, there were three basic things that every religious Jew would practice, three basic things that Jesus makes mention of. He does so in, in Matthew chapter 6, three basic things. He, he makes mention of giving your, your gifts he makes mention of your prayer life, and he makes mention of fasting. These were three basic things that were the mark of a religious person during his day. They were three things that were abused by those who were religious hypocrites because the religious hypocrites liked to give their gifts in front of people to be seen by men, because the religious hypocrites liked to pray in street corners in front of people so that the people would see them as they prayed during the hour of prayer. And the religious hypocrites would like to fast and disfigure their face so they'd be seen of men to be fasting. And Jesus said, in doing these things, these things being good in, in, of them, in and of themselves are great things to do. In doing those things for the attention that that, gar that that garners from people, they receive their reward. Now, some people say, well, I don't want to be a hypocrite, therefore I won't fast, I won't pray, I won't give. I'm going to do these things secretly and God will, and uh, God rewards openly and all. But what they're really saying is I'm not going to do any of these things at all because I want to just live a life of grace and not have any kinds of restrictions in the things that I desire to do. When you get saved, though, 
The Lord begins to move in your heart. And there may be times in your life where God will place on you a desire to fast. You might have a friend who needs the Lord, and, and you've shared with them, and, and you've tried to communicate to them about the Lord, and the Lord has said, you know what you need to do? Something you haven't done yet. This is a spiritual oppression. This is something that needs to be broken through, through a time of fasting and prayer. So why don't you lift your friend up in prayer and fast for them? And so you say, you know, Lord, are you speaking to me? You're talking to me? I don't like to, to not eat. And the Lord says, you know what? Why don't you deny your flesh for a while and, and, and just come to me? And you begin to fast and you begin to pray and you begin to see the Lord move. And you're aware of some things, and you begin to be aware of the fact that God really does demonstrate power when you do the very basic things with a sincere heart. And one of the things that you also begin to learn to do is you begin to learn to have a generous spirit. And God has a heart of compassion for those who are poor. Now, not only does he have a heart of compassion for those who are physically poor, but you have a spiritual reality to that also. Because when, when Jesus was speaking concerning blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of God, he was simply saying to us the humility of spirit that recognizes spiritual bankruptcy. Blessed is the person who realizes that they stand before God as a beggar with nothing in their hand to bring to him, to give to him. They cannot buy anything from him. They have to beg for mercy from him. Blessed is that person because if that person comes under those conditions with a the recognition they have nothing to offer God, if they can come and say, Lord, I have nothing to give to you, but I'm asking from you, I ask your mercy because I have nothing but in me that is good. Not only that, I deserve your judgment. So God, in Jesus' name, I'm asking you to forgive me, have mercy on me. When you have that heart, blessed is the poor because you've recognized your spiritual poverty and God has a heart for those who recognize their need. A lot of people hear the gospel and don't respond to it because it requires humility to actually admit that I'm lost. It requires humility to actually say, I'm not as good as I thought I was. So I'm in church with my cousin, and the minister gives an invitation, and the Holy Spirit says to my heart, turn to your cousin, Ray, and say to him, you will go with him forward at the invitation. Tell him you'll go with him. And I'm hearing this voice in my heart say, turn to your cousin and tell him you'll go with him. And I pray. And I say, no, this, is, this can't be God. And I begin to think, oh, he's just going to turn me down if I do that. And besides that, I'm already saved, and if I go forward, people are going to think that I'm getting saved, and I've been a Christian for three whole years. So I didn't. I didn't respond. I didn't turn to my cousin and say, Ray, if you need to get, for, get right with God, I'll go with you. We come home from church, and we're at my parents' house, and I'm sitting at the kitchen table, and Raymond's sitting across from me, my cousin. And he says, you want to know something, David? And I said, what? He said, you know today when that minister gave the invitation to get saved? I said, yeah. He said, I was waiting for you to ask me to go forward. I wanted to go forward to give my heart to Jesus today at his invitation. Now, obviously, I thought, oh, God, you know, you really blew it, Lord. No, I said, oh, God, look what I did. It was my pride it was my pride. It was my pride that kept me from responding when the Spirit was speaking. I wonder how many of you understand what I'm trying to say, how our pride keeps us from the things of the Lord, and it requires humility and a certain poverty of spirit to be used by God, a willingness to step up and say, yes, Lord, I'm willing to do whatever you say. You know, for many years, I would look around in this area, and I would say, Lord, there are, there are needs. Would you raise somebody up to do some of these things? And finally, the Lord said, did you ever stop to consider that this fellowship has been raised to do the things that you're always asking me to send somebody else to do? I said, I've never really thought of it that way. Well, you ought to start thinking of it that way because that's the reason for your existence. And some of us in this room need to understand today that God wants to bless you, but you need to understand your poverty before him. God has a heart for those who are spiritually impoverished. He wants to make you rich in him. And that comes through humility and reception of the things that he has to offer you. When he says in verses 15 through 17 that he shall live 
He shall live in the gold of Sheba will be given to him. He's speaking of Jesus and how worthy he is, how loving he is, how generous he is, and, and how fair he has been to people. And that's what causes people to respond to him, and that's why they come and give to him their offerings. Because out of his abundance that he has provided for them, they make offerings in return to him, and they bring these things that they might worship him. And that's the heart, again, of worship. And finally, in verses 18 through 20, blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, who only does wondrous things. My closing thought, he's saying, and this is what I've been praying for, that this shall come to pass, is that we might learn to bless God and that the whole earth may be filled with his glory. And that's the heart of David. And that should be our hearts too. May the Lord fill the earth with his glory.